Yes, welcome in. Badgers getting ready for a visit from South Dakota coming up on Saturday afternoon at Camp Randall Stadium. Going to talk about what success looks like for them here in week two. Since uh, I think what we were hoping for in week one success-wise, I don't know that we saw it. We'll see what uh, Jesse's going to be looking for here in week two. We'll also get into your Aaron Witt story from this morning uh, on the challenges and the adversity that he's had to face certainly on the field and off the field now um, as he goes through that. I know also you're going to be writing about uh, Xavier Lucas. Um, very, very excited about his future, and we'll talk about him as well and then get in week two picks as well coming up here later in the show. Before we do, a reminder that uh, Homefield is the official apparel sponsor of the camp. They have the best vintage gear in the college game. You can check it all out. They've got these new coaches jackets that they came out last week. You can check those out up, uh, check those out, excuse me, up at homefield.com. You can use the purchase or the um, promo code Bucky24 for 15% off your first purchase. Also, I know that there's certain people that only listen during the season. Just a heads up, we are also available, not just podcast wise, but on YouTube as well. So you can check that out. It's the camp podcast up on YouTube if you uh, are so inclined. Uh, Jesse, good to see you. You too, Zach. We are getting now into week two as San, Di uh, San Diego, as uh, South Dakota comes to Madison on Saturday afternoon. And Wisconsin, just a 12 and a half point favorite. We'll get into our picks later on, but the, that spread, half of what the spread was last week, I think South Dakota is going to present perhaps a more difficult test than what even Western Michigan presented last year. They're ranked, or excuse me, last week, they're ranked sixth in the FCS coming into this week. They are coming off, I think it was a 45 to three win in week one. So I'm, I'm guessing for you, success has a different look than it maybe it did heading out Western Michigan game. What, what does success look like for you in week two for the Badgers? I think it's Wisconsin doing all the things the Badgers were not able to do in week one. Now, whether they can pull that off, Hey, we're going to find out Saturday when kickoff arrives at two 30, but let's start offensively. There were obviously some good things from Ches Malusi and Tui Walker, but can you have more explosive plays in the run game? Can the offensive line be dominant? This should be a game, even against an FCS team that is highly regarded, a Big Ten program should be able to be dominant, presumably on the ground. And then in the passing game, we mentioned this before, Tyler Van Dyke threw 36 passes in the opener. Only three of those passes went 15 plus yards through the air and none of those three passes were completed. If you can't do it in a matchup like this, then when can you do it? I understand the reasons in week one, why it didn't happen based on what the staff and the players said about how Western Michigan played defensively. But I just feel like this is a game that Wisconsin, much like we thought might happen in week one, should dominate. Um, because that's, I think, what you need knowing what is on the horizon with Alabama in week three. And then it's the same thing defensively. Can they shore things up in the run? Can they be very stout? Can they put South Dakota in third long type situations where you can see some of those edge rushers make the plays that we did not see in week one? So I think it's just got to be one of those complete and total team efforts. But I will say this is the kind of matchup that scares me might be a little uh, strong, but I compare it to an NCAA tournament game. I compare it exactly to what we saw, for example, in the first round for Wisconsin basketball. And, but what I, what I mean by that is a team that is used to success. It's like playing a 30 and three team in the NCAA tournament, because this is a South Dakota team that went 10 and three a year ago. They went to the, the quarterfinals of the playoffs. They're not going to be intimidated coming in here. So I think you've got to be able to put your foot on the gas early and just uh, establish your dominance if you can. Yeah. I mean, when, the last time they, they didn't play an FCS team last year, right? They played an FCS team in 2022, I believe that was Illinois State, and that was they put up sixty something on them. I don't think that that's obviously going to happen on Saturday, but I, I need to see something from the offense. I need them to at least attempt to try and take some shots down the field. I, I know that uh, take what a defense is giving you and all that that good stuff, but you can't consistently against good opponents go fourteen plays, sixteen plays, sixteen plays. Like you just can't. It's just not going to happen. You need explosive plays in the in the uh, whether it's the run game or the pass game. I don't. I guess I don't really care where the explosive plays come from, but I do want to see them have some success or at least attempt to have some success throwing the ball down the field. And I think the only shot that they took against Western Michigan was that one to Bryson green, um, you know, towards the end zone, but that they just didn't take enough of them. And uh, so 
I mean, I'm not, I'm not even saying throw the ball all around the yard like it was last week. I'm not, I'm not even asking for that. I'm just asking to see a little bit of uh, at least an effort to throw the ball down the field. Defensively, I think South Dakota is going to provide a test for them on the ground for sure. They ran for 272 yards last last week. They averaged seven and a half or 7.8 yards per carry. Got a guy named Charles Pierre Jr. Had 136 yards on 13 carries. Wisconsin at times, at times, not always. They had, it felt like there were a lot of one to two yard gains, but Buckley had had some, I'm not going to call them gashes, but had had some nice runs last week. And I continue to be concerned about their ability to stop the run against uh, good opponents, much less, you know, um, you know, I, I struggle to have them. I, I struggle with the idea that they're going to be able to stop the run against Western Michigan uh, and, uh, and South Dakota, much less Alabama next week. So can they, can they shore that up? Because it is another offensive line that is not small there. It's a big group and it's a group that has experience. And um, that was the same thing as Western Michigan last week. And then also, how do you, how do you, speed up the quarterback if you are able to stop the run can you get after Aiden Bauman who you know is a, is a two-year starter starting a little bit in 2022 as well but yeah he's got 23 touchdowns seven interceptions in his career had just 85 yards in the opener um I don't think he's going to beat you with his legs but Wisconsin's pass rush has to be better than it was last week and how to exactly do they do that because I don't know that they blitzed a ton last week I think you know Maybe they uh, played a little bit vanilla to an extent in terms of how they wanted to to get after the quarterback, but still, you need your outside linebackers to win, and I don't think they won at a level anywhere close to what they need to for that defense to to thrive. Well, when you consider they didn't have any sacks or TFLs until Elijah Hills broke through late in the fourth quarter, then that that tells you everything you need to know. There was not enough disruption at other places. And so I, I just think this has to be the game on the schedule where you establish that to some degree so you can have more confidence going into what's going to be a, a tremendous challenge moving forward. Do you get any sense that the look ahead has happened at all? No, but would they tell us if, <laughs> if that was the case? Um, I don't think they're in a, as a player, it'd be hard not to be like, man, Alabama's coming here. This is a really consequential game at the same time. As cliche as it is, you only get 12 opportunities, and I don't think Wisconsin as a program is in a position to be like, oh, I can't wait for that Alabama game. You didn't play particularly well against Western Michigan, and you're trying to establish yourself as a program that can have a chance in week three. So I think they're probably going to come out pretty well focused because they still have a ton to prove. I could be totally wrong in this, and I'm and I'll have egg on my face, but because of the way they played last week, like if they had played awesome last week, I could totally see them. Yeah, looking past this game, but they didn't play awesome last week. They need they needed they needed a break or two to go their way to be in the position they ended up being in. Now again, they were able to dominate the fourth quarter and, and dominate the line of scrimmage when they needed in the fourth quarter. But let's just be fair about it; it wasn't uh, an overwhelming performance whatsoever. So uh, I don't think that you can look ahead. I think the other key is special teams. Um, South Dakota returned both a punt and a kickoff for a touchdown last week. We didn't get to see nearly uh, anything on kickoff because Gavin Lom was putting the ball through the end zone. And I think that probably is your best choice uh, this week as well. And the punt team only, I mean, Atticus Bertram's only punted once and it worked out pretty well. I mean, if you get that outcome every single time, I think you're going to be all right. Just magically hit somebody and recover the ball. But I, those are, I think special teams is in a game like this could give momentum to, to uh, a team that is that is the underdog coming in, but again, it's not that big of an underdog. Like twelve and a half points, that's not that's that's not a normal FCS uh, spread coming into a game. It's not, and again, South Dakota is not a normal FCS type program. This is uh, exactly the kind of game that we've seen other Big Ten or FBS level teams have some issues with, or you're dealing with trouble into the third quarter. So I'm very intrigued to see how Wisconsin responds from its week one performance, knowing what lays ahead. We'll make our picks later uh, in the show. Wanted to move on to Aaron Witt and uh, your, your story that you had up on the athletic Thursday morning and about his, his journey. And I think obviously we know all about the injury, even though maybe we haven't talked a ton about it. We know everyone that follows the program knows that he's been, uh, going through, you know, a, a lot of tough stuff in terms of the injury, but obviously on top of that, in the last week and a half, losing his mother after a two-year uh, battle with with cancer, 
um, makes it even, I think, even more impressive that he's still doing what he's doing. I think it's easy sometimes to forget that the people that we're covering, or if you're a fan, the people you're reacting to are humans and they're not just people or numbers you put into a spreadsheet and here's their statistical output. And I think Aaron really embodies what college athletics should be all about and just the effort and tenacity required. Um, this has not been an easy path. And we've talked about this dating back to the spring and really throughout the last few years about the promise that he showed way back in the Duke's Mayo Bowl in 2020. And he didn't get on the field again for 1,060 days because he dealt with um, right ankle, right foot issues that required four surgeries and didn't heal. He spent the better part of two years just rolling around to practice on a scooter. Um, so that was one aspect to it. The fact that he was able to finally play last November against Minnesota was a big deal. But at the same time, he was dealing with um, his mom's illness. His mom, Jody, was diagnosed with cancer in April 2022. And I had a chance to talk to uh, Mark Witt, who was Jody's husband, and um, obviously Aaron's dad. And he said at the time she was given basically the what the doctor said was you would be fortunate if you lived more than a year. And it, she was able to live for two years and four months and able to see things with Aaron that um, they didn't know was going to happen, including being able to see him come back to play against Minnesota, including being able to attend a practice at UW Platteville this preseason. And the, the, the goal that they had hoped was that she'd be able to be there Friday night to watch Aaron get off the bus, go through the Camp Randall arch. And um, that's not, how it transpired, she passed away five days earlier uh, on a Sunday night, so five days before the, the Friday game, and Aaron was able to go home and see her during preseason practice for a weekend, knowing that that was going to be the last time that he had a chance to be with her, and he came back to Madison. She passed away eight days later, and so, um, you know, it's been a tremendously difficult situation for the entire family, and I think Aaron, who's always demonstrated a lot of perseverance, has a lot of perspective, which is something that he talked about uh, when I talked to him earlier this week for just, he, he said, he feels like he has more empathy for what people are going through. Cause you don't necessarily know how, how, what kind of struggles they're, they're enduring. And, and he's certainly been through a lot and you know, his mom was kind of the rock of the family and football was such a big deal. She was part of the touchdown club and fundraising uh, for the football program in Winona, Minnesota. And I thought this was really telling of the type of person that, that she was, is she told Mark that, she didn't want to have a celebration of her life until after football season because she didn't want anything to disrupt Aaron going through this year. And so uh, the way Mark put it, um, and this was a moment of levity during a, a tough conversation, is she said, I will come back and haunt you if you don't listen to me. Um, so, you know, he, he said she, she was the type of person who even in death is putting herself first. And I think we saw that reflected in Aaron, too, and the selflessness he's demonstrated to go through all these challenges and still put forward the effort that he's doing. It is remarkable, especially for somebody that young and having to been through what he's been through. But I mean, anybody that's, that's lost a parent, um, you know, knows some of what he's going through, but the fact that he loses him, loses her at this age, like a lot of us get to spend a lot more time uh, with our mothers and our fathers. And he doesn't get that, that chance. And that, um, and that sucks and that hurts. And I, and I feel for him um, because, you know, you just don't, you don't get to experience all these moments with her. You know what I mean? Like you don't get to experience walking through the tunnel. You don't get to, get to experience going to her after the game, you know, on the, that home sideline and giving her a hug. And those are all things that um, he's going to miss out on and that she's going to miss out on. And I, you know, it's just, I feel for him. And I, I, I feel for him and I feel for obviously Amari Snowden in the same, in the same respect, because he's obviously going through that same thing. And, uh, you know, I don't have the words to express it. It just, it just sucks to even think about what those guys are having to go through uh, at their age, because they're not going to get to experience that stuff with their parents. Yeah. And you mentioned the previous show we did, how Aaron came out for interviews and he still had the eye black and the Jersey on and, um, that's how he went out to go see his family. So it was his dad, his older sister, Allison, who's three years older, and then his uncle, uh, Jody's brother, they attended the game Friday. And first thing he did was he, he went outside the double doors where the Student Athlete Performance Center is to meet his family near that parking lot and, and share an embrace. And he talked about how, you know, what went through his mind was all the youth football games that he used to have, that he would drive home with his mom and they would talk about the game and how important those conversations were and how he would never be able to have them again with her. So yeah, obviously our hearts go out to him and, and the family and um, anybody having to deal with 
something like that. Yeah, it's it's terrible. And I yeah. Um so hopefully for him that it gives him strength, obviously, that that he knows that she's still with him in some respect. And certainly it sounds like the rest of the family is is, is rallying around, but um hopefully he's able to uh use that. And you know, Luke Fickle was talking about earlier this week. It's it, people that don't know him don't know what he's been through, but it's pretty easy to see pretty quickly his passion for the game. And I think we're going to continue to see that. Yeah. I thought another interesting note uh, from talking to him is I asked him, what would you say has been the best moment of your time at Wisconsin? And I realized there haven't been a ton of individual moments, but Hey, he could have picked the fact that he had just come off a fourth and one stop off the edge to help Wisconsin win the game in the opener big moment for him at Camp Randall. And you know what he talked about? He talked about the investment that other people put into him when they had no reason to invest in him because they didn't know if he was ever going to play again. And he talked about how hard Bobby April coached him in that 2021 season when he was out for the year, the way he would ask him questions like he was going to play in the game. And obviously the strength staff now outside linebackers coach Matt Mitchell. And he talked about some of the alums who took him under, under um, their wing, like Chris or Jack Sitchi, Mike Caputo, um, Alec James, just people who, had been around the program of late and that's what came to his mind. I thought that was really interesting and speaks to just the type of person that he is. And I think maybe why he's been able to continue to have success because it hasn't necessarily always been about him. He's wanted to be there because of how much he loves football and that passion you're talking about and being able to be there for coaches and teammates. Again, I know we are neutral observers We're supposed to be neutral and you do a lot better of a job than I do, but, um, quite frankly, I'm going to be rooting for him. Um, that's just, uh, going to be rooting for him for the rest of the year and, and um, you know, what, whatever his future holds. So um, uh, not a, a great transition, but um, moving on to a, another guy who I think has a bright future at Wisconsin, and that is uh, Xavier Lucas. And uh, he might just be that dude. Um, we, we got to see him in one possession last week, and he ended that possession with an interception. And we all knew – or I should say we were all told that he was going to be a very good player. And how did, we, you know, Florida State and Miami let him get out of the state of Florida. And I think we're starting to see, and we saw in that game on Friday night, why a lot of people think that. I had a chance to talk to his parents for a story that's going to be publishing Friday at The Athletic. And I can tell you they're still both shocked that he's at Wisconsin. Um, just obviously being as talented as he is, being from South Florida, they thought he would be staying closer to home. It says a lot about the recruiting efforts that Wisconsin was able to put into him, Paul Haynes and the, the recruiting staff in general to get him to sign. Um, Wisconsin has had a lot of players that they have taken out of South Florida area, defensive backs in particular, but I don't know that they've had a lot of guys with the ceiling of a Xavier Lucas, so a four-star prospect who could have gone almost anywhere and we're seeing it. And the fact that he did this without coming here early for the spring is even more impressive. One of the things that was interesting and in, in part of his backstory is he transferred his senior year to American Heritage, which American Heritage, which is a, a very high-end private school. But in doing that, it meant that he could not leave early. He had to finish out the school year. So he knew what he was getting into and obviously made the most of it his senior year and has only gotten better since he got here. But absolutely what he was able to do in his first uh, game as a college player shows you what the ceiling could be and it's got to be exciting so what do his parents think about him being up here then well i think they want him to be happy and they left the decision up to him and if this is what you want to do then you should do it i think they think it's pretty far away but you know it's also notable that ricardo holman is here and i can't overstate the importance that ricardo had they actually share the same uh position coach or um, person that they they train with who was the DB's coach for Xavier Lucas in high school. And so Ricardo was training with Xavier before um, he was committed to the Badgers before Xavier was. So I think that was helpful here too, that there was somebody else from the area who had come this far away and had had success. Ricardo had a seven interception season a year ago. So um, look, they, they want him to be successful and if he can do it at Wisconsin uh, further away than they would want, but it's his decision. 
I mean, they do have a number of Florida guys, right? Like it's mm-hmm. it's it's obviously not just Ricardo Hallman, but it's also not what it used to be either. Where like because that was Brett, I mean Brett Bielema loved South Florida. He turned like Wisconsin didn't recruit South Florida a ton before he got here. And then it became kind of a hotbed for a lot of the talent that they brought up. And it's not that Wisconsin hasn't recruited that. Obviously, Jonas Taclona from from Florida as well, and um, Jake Cheney, and you know a number of other Quincy Burroughs, I believe, is is from Florida as well. There's a number of other guys. It's just I don't know that they have. Uh, I don't know that that Paul hit it as much maybe as as they did before. But um, it's such a for fertile ground that you're going to be able to get some of these guys that maybe didn't want to end up or w- weren't wanted, even though I don't think that was the case with certainly with um, uh, Xavier, uh, maybe at Florida state, just because they had taken so many highly ranked kids. Right. But like uh, Miami was right there and they beat Miami for him. So it, it was a huge win. And I, again, my bold take before the season uh, was that he's going to end up starting. And I thought it was interesting that in a, I thought it was, it, the game was still in doubt, right? I mean, I know it was a two score game. There's only three or four minutes left, but the way that um, you just never know. And for them to throw him out there in that situation, I think spoke volumes because it wasn't like Ricardo Holman wasn't out there. Ricardo was on the other side. M- much of the first team defense was still in and he was getting those reps. Yeah. And I was on the phone with Xavier's mom as well as her sister at the same time. And I thought it was interesting that um, the sister was talking about how um, when Miami was initially recruiting him, there was a couple guys who ended up leaving and going to Alabama. And uh, there was a period where, based on how she put it, Miami dropped the ball. And it wasn't until late that Mario Cristobal and the staff really went hard after him. Xavier took that visit to Miami before the early signing period. But I I have to think and what ultimately won with Wisconsin is how consistent they were throughout the process and how they made him feel wanted. And why did they do that? Because they recognized his value and that he could be an early impact type of player. Um, And they were proven right. I think, I don't know what the ceiling is for him, but he started his high school career as a safety. He spent his first two years of high school as a safety and then didn't transition until corner until his junior year. He didn't have any interceptions as a junior. And then he transfers to another school as senior year. He has five interceptions. Meanwhile, he helps his team win a four by 100 relay state championship. And he cut his 100 time down by like five tenths of a second um, to be able to do that in such a short period of time speaks to the, the sheer like raw talent that he has. And so if that can be harnessed and honed with this staff, yeah, he seems like that next great defensive back for Wisconsin. Do you think he will be? Look, it's it's early to put predictions on somebody, but he's got everything making, going for him. He has everything going you, for him. Yeah, I'm so making how, you do it anyways. How, well, how could you say? How could you say it, it's not him based on early returns? The guy's only been here for like two months. He's already getting reps and meaning a meaningful moment and make taking advantage of it in the very first game. How many true freshmen, especially at that position, do we see do that? Uh, at Wisconsin, not a ton. I mean, I, you go back and think about the true freshman that, that played corner since you've covered the team. I think there's one and I would, that's Sojourn Sojourn Shelton. Shelton. Yeah. And he came in early. He came in early and was, was a part of, I I remember because there's only like two guys that came in early. It was him and somebody else. And he had like a great spring, uh, 2013. I wasn't covering the team yet, but he, he had a great spring in 2013 and was like kind of locked in and he started there for four years. Uh, so it doesn't happen very often at Wisconsin. If you go back, it just, it doesn't. And it, it's kind of like the offensive line. Like you, you have all these great, these really good players, uh, but none of them usually start as freshmen. And then you got Travis Frederick, who's just there. And, <laughs> you know, he's a starting center in that opening week, red shirts the next year and then plays two more years and then goes and has an all pro career with Dallas. So it's a rarity. And for if he, you know, it's not a rarity. I, I shouldn't say it's a rarity for guys to play, right? Like Rashad Wild Goose played, but like in terms of like getting put in there in key moments very, very early in your career, doesn't happen very often. Yeah. So speaks to his talent. Yeah, it definitely does. Um, I just want to do this quickly. I, I, I don't want to dive too deep into it. I know people are going to be like, shut up, but I just wanted your take on this. Obviously, Wisconsin and Nebraska both restarted um, 
overhauls of the program last year. Matt Rule, obviously, at Nebraska. Luke Fickle at Wisconsin. Nebraska has seemingly gotten off to a very, very good start uh, this year, obviously, with the, their win last week. And now they have a bigger test this week with Colorado, though. Again, I don't think Colorado's any good. And uh, it's it's insane that Mike Hill, uh, who used to be an ESPN guy, I don't think he's at ESPN anymore, g- gave them a vote a single vote in the AP poll and he said the only reason he did it is because everybody else was hating. And so that's the only reason he gave them a vote, which is just insane. And you shouldn't have a vote if that's how you're going to, if that's how you're going to do it, but irrelevant. Um, I wanted to ask you just because it's been a bit of a sputter and obviously Nebraska did not go to a bowl game last year. They have not been to a bowl game since 2016. Wisconsin has beaten them every year since 2012. They've only lost once since they came into the big 10, but that said for you, which program has a brighter future? Is it Wisconsin or Nebraska? That is a hard question. I think what was I think what Nebraska has going for it very obviously is that it has a five-star quarterback in Dylan Riola who started the first game and helped lead the team to a 47 victory against UTEP and they scored the last 33 points. So if we're going to be is it a prisoner of the moment maybe in part, but I just you can't overstate the importance of having a quarterback like that. Whereas Wisconsin has gone through two consecutive years of a, a guy with one year of eligibility left. And then you don't necessarily know what it's going to look like in the quarterback room. I think your success starts with having a high level quarterback like that. So Wisconsin had a better first season under Luke fickle when compared to Matt rule and Nebraska hasn't been to a bowl game in eight years, but it kind of feels like you'd be inclined to pick Nebraska for the immediate future. I mean, people are talking about whether Nebraska can start the season seven and zero going into a game against Ohio state. I don't know whether that's going to happen, but having a guy like Riola gives them a chance. That's the thing. They have the quarterback and yes, but I think it's also worth noting that after on uh, October 24th, of 2020, I thought Wisconsin had the quarterback too. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, after throwing five touchdowns and only having one incompletion or whatever it was, like you thought they had the quarterback. I'm going to wait a little bit on it, but if they hit and it, and obviously Ryle was higher, certainly higher ranked than Graham and has a little bit more to his game than Graham does. But I'm inclined to say that they have their quarterback. And if they have their quarterback, then it's hard to sit there and say, no, they're, go- they're not going to be a better program than uh, Wisconsin because he's quarterbacks are just, they make everything different. Look at, Look at Miami. A lot of the a lot of the same guys as last year. I shouldn't say a lot of the guys. A, a number of guys from last year, and you just change out the quarterback, and they just beat the heck out of Florida. And Cam Ward looked very very good doing it. So uh, to me, quarterback as it is in the NFL means so much in college football. And it's not like you have to be a great quarterback that's going to have an NFL career you can have a great college career look at Cam Rising at Utah he's not going to play in, he's not going to have a great career in the NFL but he has it he's been fantastic in college and if you have that great I, I don't know that was certainly I don't think I mean I don't again I don't want to jump to conclusions here I don't think like Wisconsin has that on their roster right now yeah, if we're just talking about this season or the next couple of seasons, then I'd be inclined to say Nebraska, but that doesn't mean that I'm saying Wisconsin is about to go into the tank. I mean, it's still so early in this process for Luke Fickle and the staff, um, but it does. It has to come back to the quarterback if we're, if we're going to make this kind of comparison. Yeah. I'm sure people are going to be very excited about that conversation that we just had and spent three seconds on it. But I, just something that popped into my mind last night when I was preparing for the show. Uh, the other thing that popped into my mind when I was preparing for the show last night, and not it even popped into my mind, but it's been a story here the, the these last few weeks, is obviously the new athletic facility that's being built, the new football facility that's being built, the shells being torn down, and um, the uh, new facilities going up. But also as a part of that, the these bricks that are on the Camp Randall Memorial Parkway or park in that area, uh, there's these per- personalized bricks that you could have, you can buy. And I think they started back in 1993 and they were like a hundred bucks and they were considered permanent. Like they were just, they were just going to be there. Um, I know permanent doesn't mean permanent. I, I get that. Um, but these were like memorialized bricks. People were putting these bricks down for family members that had passed away. Um, I, I read the story from the journal Sentinel today about a, uh, a woman who, you know, grew up loving the Badgers and going to games and all that stuff. And she passed away in 2016 and this whole group got together and they bought a brick for her as a memorial. Cause she loved the Badgers and they, they, they bought this brick and, um, 
now Wisconsin is tearing that whole side up, which I don't think I have a problem. I don't think anybody has a problem with them tearing it up. I think the problem comes is they're not going to then move those bricks somewhere else. They are either giving them back to you, which you can go down and get them and you can get and you can get it, or they're being thrown away. And the I think the other problem for people, which again, I mean, I, I guess, but I think the other problem for people is I don't think anybody actually was notified about it. Uh, there was a Badger Extra story from a couple of weeks ago that said, I think it was August 19th, said that things would be communicated to people that you could come down and get your brick. I haven't seen any, like, I get all the emails from UW uh, and like the UW Badgers, like the ones that they send to fans as well. And there hasn't been anything about it. So I think a lot of people are getting caught off guard and they're not going to, like, these bricks are special to people. And uh, the fact that they're not, they, that they didn't make people aware that they were doing this and the fact that they're doing it in general and just not taking them and, and moving them somewhere else. Um, it's, it's a really, really tough look, a really, really tough look. And uh, I think this is another part of the, the whole camp Randall area is because you, the, you have the Memorial there in honor of the soldiers and just veterans. And uh, they are obviously constructing even more on that property as well. So there are a lot of uh, a lot of things that are going on around that area that I don't think people are overly happy with, but I think the commu- lack of communication about it, I think was probably one of the bigger things for people because they didn't even know what was happening. It's uh, I think it's popped up on the message boards. I think it's popped up um, on some change pos- petitions, change.org petitions. I just, I don't want to be too over emotional about it. I, I, I just find it um uh, kind of crazy that you couldn't find someplace else for those bricks to put them somewhere within a new facility. That's 300, a $300 million facility. You couldn't find someplace to put them um, because these are the fans that put down money. And it's not like it's a lot of money. It was like a hundred bucks back in 1993, but they mean something to you, to it. Like people aren't buying bricks there. If Wisconsin doesn't mean something to them or that Badger football doesn't mean something to them. And so uh, I think it's just a, it's a tough look, I think for Wisconsin right now. And it, it comes on the top on on the heels of a little bit of a tough look with some of the replay, you know, the premium seating and knocking some people out of rows at the Kohl center. Um, it just, it just feels, it feels a little off for me. I don't have enough information, so I don't want to speak out of turn on it, but yes, people would have bought those bricks so they could be part of the tapestry of what is being around camp Randall stadium and the meaning that it has behind them. And people didn't buy them for them to be sent back to them. Eventually they bought them so they could be a part of that place forever is a long time, but certainly longer than three decades. So yes, it'd be nice. If there could be a place for them somewhere. Yeah. Again, I, I don't know that they were expecting the, the, perhaps the backlash that was, that was coming with it, but I, it, I don't think it's just the action of it. I think it's obviously also the, the lack of communication about it as well, but what are you going to do? Um, all right. We are going to get now into, our picks for the week. All right. So week one, you were better than me. I mean, I, that's I, the, the record just shows it. You went four and three. I went three and four. I don't know. That was a great week for either of us, but above 500 is, is always a positive when you're not putting any money down like you. Um, so, <laughs> Uh, let's get into this. Biggest game of the week is number three, Texas traveling to number 10, Michigan. And Texas is a seven and a half point favorite in that game. I feel like all I have to go on clearly is one game for each of these programs. And I'm going to react accordingly and say that Texas is going to go into the big house and cover. Uh, Michigan has some questions, beat Fresno state 30 to 10. Um, and Texas has Quinn Ewers. They look very good in week one. So they're one of the best teams in the country. I think they cover. Yeah. I mean, I, I want to go with Michigan. I do just because of uh, it's the defending national champ. They did not obviously get off to a, a fresh, a great start against Fresno state. They still a little bit undecided at quarterback. I think they're starting a different guy this time around. Um, so yeah. And Texas might, and, and Texas might be legit. I'm going to, I think I'm going to take Texas as well going to the big house. Again, I don't think Michigan's an overly tough place to play. I, I think it's more about the team than it is the crowd for sure. Um, uh, the other top 25 matchup this weekend, Tennessee ranked 14th in the country, eight point favorites at number 24 NC state. 
big number for two top 25 teams going on the road, but Tennessee just had 700 plus yards of total offense against Chattanooga. Okay, fine. Um, they just look very good. They looked a lot better in the opener than NC State did. So based on that, I think the Vols will go on the road and like Texas cover in a top 25 matchup. I think uh, Nico, and I'm not going to even try and pronounce his last name. I think it's, uh, I am going to try and pri- pronounce it. Lama, no, I'm not. Uh, the <laughs> Tennessee quarterback, fantastic. Maybe, maybe end up being the Heisman Trophy uh, winner this year. I think he is, he is that good and he may be the best quarterback in the country, um, by the end of the year. And NC state was not impressive in week one. I'm going to take Tennessee as well. Iowa state traveling to Kinnick stadium, take on number 21, Iowa, the Hawkeyes, two and a half point favorites in that one. Well, we all know that Iowa's offense is now completely fixed. They have a freshman sensation. Cade McNamara looks like the second coming of Deacon Hill and (laughs) <laughs> I, <laughs> I think Iowa is going to win and cover at home, but this is a big one for the Hawkeyes. Cause this is a, I mean, this is a rivalry that doesn't really get national play, but is very hotly contested. And Iowa, I think people believe has an outside outside shot to be a college football playoff team because their schedule consists of Ohio state. And other than that is, is manageable. Yeah. They get Washington at home. They go to Ohio state, obviously, but uh, they get Wisconsin at home. They get UCLA. They have to go to UCLA. They also get Nebraska at home. This may be one of their tougher games. You could, I guess, you could could make an argument uh, that it is. But um, I'm going to take Iowa as well at home. Two and a half makes sense to me. Nine, number 19, Kansas, going on the road. They are five and a half point favorites. Going to face Brett Bielema and Illinois. It's a hard one for me. I went to Kansas for grad school. I'm from Kansas, but Luke Altmeyer threw four touchdowns in the opener. Um, yes, again, Eastern Illinois. I think the fighting Brett Bielema's are going to, if not win, then at least keep this close. And so I'm going to say that um, Illinois manages to cover their end of it. This was kind of a coming out party last year for for Kansas. Uh, they played down in um, they played down at Kansas last year and. They jumped out to a, I think it was a 28 to seven lead, went on to win 34 23 in a game that, I mean, going into that one, I think a lot of people are thinking Illinois was going to be, it's going to be good last year. They were, I think there were a lot of people continuing off of what they did in 2022. And it obviously did not uh, play out that way. I am going to take Kansas going into Illinois. I just love Kansas's offense. I, I do. And I trust, uh, I, I trust Lance Leipold a ton. And uh, Brett Bielma still has me blocked on Twitter. So, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I feel like these are all coming together for Kansas to, to cover at Illinois. Uh, Boise State on the road at number seven, Oregon. The Ducks, 19 and a half point favorites, coming off a very so-so performance against Jason Eck, former Badger, and Idaho last week. Well, Boise State beat Georgia Southern, was it 56 to 45? I, I, <laughs> I just... I know Oregon was not very good against Idaho and it kind of shocked the college football viewing world, but I think they're going to get right. And Dylan Gabriel is going to look like a, a Heisman candidate. Uh, and I think they're going to cover it out in stadium. I do as well. I mean, I, I'm not expecting back-to-back performances from an or from that Oregon offense like that. And, and as you said, Boise state, um, not the same Boise state as maybe we remember. Not Colorado, the Statue of Liberty, uh, Boise State team from what, 2007. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Man, it's been I'm a few old. years. It's been a few years. Um, I wonder if they're still married. Do you think they're still married? I don't know. I think you can carry that for the rest, rest of your life. Yeah. yeah. Uh, before Wisconsin and South Dakota, Colorado at Nebraska. We kind of talked about Nebraska a little bit earlier. Nebraska is seven and a half point favorites. Colorado got... Uh, every piece of North Dakota state that it wanted last week. And quite honestly, if not for a few calls here or there may have lost that game. And yet Deion Sanders, you know, still, still talking that game. Uh, but uh, they are traveling to Lincoln this time and taking on Dylan Ryle and the, and the, and the Huskers, Nebraska seven and a half point favorites. I think I said that. Yeah. This one might be the hardest one on the slate here to pick because it's a question of, at least in my mind. So how much do I trust Nebraska? Um, And I don't think Colorado is a very good team. And at the same time, I'd have a couple of the best players on the field. I mean, Travis Hunter, what do you have? Three touchdowns in in the opener. Um, Had at least two. Yeah. I think he had three, Um, but 
I wasn't a math major. Um, and Shador Sanders, like, I don't think Colorado is a good football team, but seven and a half feels like a lot. Um, but I'm going to talk myself into Nebraska for this one. <laughs> I was going to say, where are you going with this? I didn't, <laughs> that was, that was a hell of a roller coaster dry, uh, ride Sometimes right there. I put myself on a roller coaster as I talk through the pick. Yeah. So I am not a fan of Colorado whatsoever. I may have been the, uh, uh, biggest <clears throat> cheerleader, uh, at, at monks while watching that last week, last Thursday, I, I just, it's not that it's, it's not that I'm a hater on Dion. I just don't think they're any good. And it's, we just keep on giving them attention for, for very little reasons outside of what you just mentioned, Travis Hunter and Shadur Sanders. Cause both of those guys may be some of the uh, two of the better players in the country. I think, I think Travis Hunter is easily the best two-way player in the country and certainly could very well be in the conversation for the Heisman uh, at the end of this year, probably should be, and probably is going to be a top five pick in the NFL, maybe even maybe even higher, maybe a, a top two. We'll see what the quarterback situation looks like next year and who has the number one pick. He's that good, but at home at Nebraska, and and I, I again, I, I don't know if I buy Nebraska being great by any stretch, but they are better than Colorado. And I think that they're going to uh, I think they're going to win that game and cover uh, South Dakota coming to Wisconsin. The spread I saw was 12 and a half. What do you got? Well, we've got to hold ourselves accountable, right? I think we both picked Wisconsin to cover as 24 point favorites in the opener against Western Michigan. So I want to throw that out there um, not to undermine our picks now, even though I just did. I think Wisconsin will cover this, though, as I said before, this is the kind of matchup that can be scary uh, just because South Dakota is used to having success. but. I, I don't know. I don't know that anybody would feel particularly good about Wisconsin's program if they sneak out a seven point or a 10 point win, though, obviously it'd be better than losing. I just think this is a game that Wisconsin shows a little bit more of what it's capable of and covers. I said before the season, I was taking a wait and see approach and you got to show me you're good before I'm going to say you're good. And then I went and picked them to cover a 24 point spread. Um, I'm not going to do that this time. I'm going to go back to off season Zach and say, prove it. And so I'm going to, I'm going to have South Dakota covering that. And if it gets close, you just never know. So I could be, I, I have no problem if it gets shoved back in my face, but it's, it's one of those things where you keep on doing something and I keep on believing you, even though what you have shown isn't, uh, hasn't been great. At some point you just have to say, prove it. And, uh, I'm, sh I'm sure as I say that they will. So that's, uh, Badger so fans are lucky. So we differ on two picks this week, right? Kansas at Illinois and South Dakota at Wisconsin. Yep. There's, there's some room for separation here. Big some week for se separation. And we'll see. Uh, yeah. We'll see how it goes. We will be back uh, coming up on Sunday to break it all down. What things look like against South Dakota and look ahead to a significant matchup the following weekend against Alabama as they come to Madison. Jesse, thank you very much. Thanks Zach. All right. There he is. Jesse Temple from the athletic. You've been listening to the camp.